some examples of non-Christian goals and considered the issue of tragic moral choices, let's look at positively what are some of the larger goals that Scripture presents for us as our uh, primary things we're to look, work for. What are some biblical goals? Well, we know that our shorter catechism says, what is man's chief end? And it says man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So I believe that's a scriptural teaching. That that's our primary goal. That's the focus of our life. So first let's think about glorifying God. What does that mean, to glorify God? Well, we're not adding anything to him. It's not like he is not glorious and we have to add glory to him. Instead, we glorify God by recognizing him for who he is. We praise him. We acknowledge him in all things. And we cause others to do so as well. So this is how we glorify God. See, in Genesis 1, 26 to 30, we read of God creating man and telling him to rule over creation. This is man's purpose. And this is what God has created him to do. This is how God determined his role would be. And so when we do that, when we carry out that role, we are glorifying God. We're fulfilling his purpose in our lives. 1 Corinthians 10.31, we're told whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, do all to the glory of God. So everything we do in life, even down to the mundane things like eating and drinking, that's all to be done to please God. Then Colossians 3.23 tells us, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. So our focus is on God and on pleasing Him, not on others, not on ourselves. Our focus is on what brings glory to God. Now, the second part of our catechism answer says, remember it says to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. So one of the goals we work for is enjoyment of God. Notice, I didn't just say enjoyment. Our goal is not to enjoy ourselves forever. It's to enjoy God. See, Scripture talks, for example, in Psalm 1-2, how God's law is our delight. So our delight, our pleasure, Psalm 1-2, his delight is in the law of the Lord. Psalm 119-14, I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. So this is where we find our pleasure, our enjoyment. Notice Deuteronomy 4.40, that God's law was given to us for our good. He says, you shall keep his statutes that it may go well with you and your children after you. You know, contemporary Christian author John Piper has written about the concept of Christian hedonism. That is, man seeks pleasure. And it's a good thing to seek pleasure. But the only way we're really going to have pleasure is to be faithful to the Lord. Our true pleasure is found only as we seek pleasure. We seek our enjoyment in God. The whole book of Ecclesiastes speaks about the vanities of pursuing pleasure apart from God. So if we truly find enjoyment, if we truly find pleasure, it's only going to be as we're faithful to the Lord. Jesus tells us another goal that we should have. That's the kingdom of God. In Matthew 6.33, Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, he's speaking about the issues of life, all these things shall be added to you. So we long to see God's kingdom, his reign, his rule, come on earth and be manifest in every area of life. Good things are those which display God's kingship over the world. Bad actions are those that obscure his rule. Our focus in life, as Jesus said, is not on the things of this world. God will take care of those. He'll provide those for us as long as we keep his kingdom uppermost in our lives. So, let's think now about how this view of goals, a biblical view of goals, compares to utilitarianism. You see, we looked earlier when we were talking about motives. We saw that a biblical view of motives 
compares to existentialism. So here we can compare and contrast a biblical view of goals, outcomes, and situations to uh, Joseph Fletcher and John Stuart Mill's utilitarianism. So there's some similarities and there's some differences. Similarities, for one thing, we do believe that outcomes or results are important. When we make choices, we not only think about whether the choice itself is good, but whether it has good results. So we are concerned about the outcomes. Again, think about my example of the beggar on the street. My desire is not just to give him money. My desire is that the money results in him feeding himself, ultimately, that he might come to know the grace of Christ. So those are my goals. That's the outcome I desire. Second, we do believe that different situations lead to different actions or choices. Okay, remember our example of the student running down the hall. Okay, if he's running down the hall to try to be late, that's different than running down the hall trying to save the teacher's life. So our situations are important. We have to consider those. Now, there are important differences, though, with Fletcher and Mill. First, we believe standards are important. There are right and wrong things as defined by God's law. Okay, the end doesn't justify them any means at all. It only justifies those means that are in line with Scripture. I can't say, well, my goal is evangelism, so I'm going to carry out that by offering cash payments to everyone who comes forward at an altar call. Okay, that's an inappropriate means of achieving the end. I can't get students in school to be quiet by offering them crack cocaine if they behave. Okay. So the end does not justify the means. Standards are important. Second, utilitarianism ignores the importance of the heart because they say if good results follow, it doesn't matter what my attitude is. It's just, okay, I do something that brings about a good result. Biblically, we've already seen faith is important. We must act in faith. We must act in love. Our heart attitude is important for our actions. Now, after this video, there's a brief quiz on this concept of goals. Don't worry, it's not going to be graded. The purpose of this quiz is to give you a chance to review in your mind some of these key points we've been discussing. After you take the quiz, you could also post comments on the discussion board if you wish. Uh, you can feel free to do so. You can interact with others. After you take the quiz, then we're going to move into the next section of this class, which is looking at the standard of biblical ethics. We'll look at the, what the Bible teaches about the standard, and then we'll begin looking at the Ten Commandments.